Okay, good morning, evening, or afternoon, depending on what the case may be. If you are listening to this, you should be expecting an audio lecture on the readings from this week, the Library of Greek Mythology excerpt by Apollodorus, and the Theogony by Hesiod. Uh, before I start, uh, I would suggest that from our Canvas site, you download the Apollodorus reading so that you can have that open in front of you and in a separate window you reopen Canvas so that you can have the Hesiod reading in front of you or you could download the Hesiod reading as well uh, by copying and pasting it into a Word document. Uh, hopefully this will not take too long this is going to be separated into three parts. We're going to start with just some basic information on our writers Apollodorus and Hesiod then we'll move into uh, the Library of Greek Mythology by Apollodorus, so the Apollodorus creation story file. And then we'll finish with a look at the Hesiod text. Uh, the goal here is not to go through every line of each of these works, but to simply take a look at each one, a few passages from each one, just to give you a little bit of guided understanding of these texts. So before we start, just some basic background on these two writers. Both Hesiod and Apollodorus are Greek, uh, but they are writing at very different times and with very different goals. So, for example, Hesiod, we know, lived somewhere around 700 BC. Apollodorus, however, exists somewhere between 100 and 200 AD. So there's eight or nine hundred years of difference between these two. Um, it is also hard for us to say much about Apollodorus as a person. In fact, it's entirely likely and possible that he is numerous people whose work has been called together. So the name Apollodorus may actually refer to a variety of writers uh, who took the work that we're going to look at and edited it, made changes to it over the course of time. Uh, Hesiod is definitely a poet and an artist. Uh, he would have written in a very particular structure, format. Uh, unfortunately, the version we're reading does not retain that poetic structure and is written instead in prose. But he was definitely an artist who is out to make a work of literary art. Apollodorus, on the other hand, is working very much to compile. He's creating a history. The name of his text is the Library of Greek Mythology. So think of this as more encyclopedic, an attempt to collect a variety of stories, Greek history, mythological history, if you will. Um, one thing that we will see between both of these pieces of writing is we're going to see a lot of names because these works are very genealogical, which essentially means creating a family tree. One thing that you should not be worried about is trying to memorize all of these names. I'm not going to ask you on a quiz or a test to be able to remember every single person, every single character who is uh, present here. So please don't feel like that's something that you need to do. Um, because that's not what we're interested in. You know, you're going to see, if you, assuming you've read already, and you should have read these texts already. If you have not read them yet, I would pause here and read them before you start listening to the rest. Uh, anyway, you're going to see several passages throughout both of these that are just long lists of names that I don't expect you to know. Um, one other thing both of these texts are doing in different ways is they are embedding a variety of mythological tales within their history. So we're going to see stories, and Apollodorus does this a little bit more. He will give us stories of characters like Orpheus and Eurydice, Pluto and Persephone, the revolts of the giants, Prometheus, whereas Hesiod's going to only get into a couple. He'll mention Perseus, he'll mention Typhus. Uh, and we'll get into the reason for that when we get to Hesiod. Uh, Apollodorus also places significantly more focus on our two original gods that we'll look at in a second, Uranus 
and Gi, or Gaia. Whereas Hesiod, assuming you've read, you'll know, focuses very much more on Zeus. And again, the other big difference is very much stylistic. Hesiod is much more artistic and philosophical, whereas Apollodorus is crafting a library that is factual and historic. Uh, we'll also see some other differences uh, as we get into these tales uh, when we look at them specifically. One thing you should know is Apollodorus is going to be mixing Roman and Greek names. So if that confuses you, I'm sorry, but that's what's going to be happening here. So we're going to see them switching. So if you think you know a character and then suddenly that character is being identified by some other name, that's because Apollodorus is using both Roman and Greek names. Just a little bit of history here. Greek mythology existed first, and then at some point thereafter, the Romans essentially stole and borrowed the Greek pantheon and made it their own. Okay, so at this point, it would be good for you to bring up your copy of the Apollodorus text so that we can look at this. We're not going to go through every single page in great detail, but I just want to look at some things to make you aware of them. So one thing that is similar between Apollodorus and Hesiod is that we're beginning with a theogony. The word theogony is a Greek word that means birth of the gods. So we're going to find out how the world began in both of these stories. So here we start with the character name Uranus, O-U-R-A-N-O-S. This is the first rule of the universe. He was married to Gi, or often called Gaia, the earth. Uh, and so we get this long list of all these children, so we're immediately seeing the problem and difficulty with following everything that Apollodorus is doing. We've got a dozen names in the first paragraph. All you need to really know is that Uranus and Gaia were the parents of the Titans, and some of those Titans will be involved in what happens next. Now, one thing that you should have noticed happens in both the Apollodorus text as well as Hesiod is we see revolting children, children who fight back against a father who is very domineering. A father wants to keep their power, so he ties up or swallows their children and does away with them. And then, of course, this comes back to bite them. So, we see at the end of the first page, page 27, we've got uh, Kronos taking over and then he decides to do the same thing. But we do get the story of Zeus and lots and lots more names. One thing that I do want to draw your attention to here is this is on page 28 and 29, we're constantly seeing parentage. So one thing that Apollodorus is doing throughout here is he's giving us a very clear sense of who's related to who. So who is your father? who is your mother, who is your grandfather. Lineage is going to be something that we're going to find is very important to the Greeks as we go. We'll see this when we get into the Iliad and the Odyssey, these human characters spouting off who, they're, who they come from. And we see that also. This is something that we do see in the Theogony as well. Um, okay, one thing I would draw your attention to, we're going to skip forward a couple pages. Uh, and look at the story of how Hephaestus and Athena were born. Hera gave birth to Hephaestus without prior intercourse. This is at the bottom of page 30, though Homer describes him as another of her children by Zeus. So one thing that happens here uh, is not only is Apollodorus telling us a variety of stories, but we're also getting him saying, well, here's what this person said about this story. So, Harry gave birth to Hephaestus without prior intercourse, though Homer describes him as another of her children by Zeus. These are conflicting tales. But again, remember, what Apollodorus is doing is, this, Apollodorus is, doing is giving us history. Not only is he giving us the history, but he's also trying to capture what other people have said about things. So part of his history is sort of a bibliography. A here has who written here is what has been written by who. Now, notice that in this story, we get that Zeus threw Hephaestus down from heaven for coming to the aid of his mother when she saw, when she was put in chains. So we're getting Zeus being angry and doing something angry. We're going to see something very different in Hesiod's story. 
So this is just something I wanted to point out. Again, we're not going through this text in great detail because there's just a lot of information here. Um, but notice on page 33, we get a little bit into the story of Pluto, also known as Hades, and Persephone. So this is an example of where Pluto is the Roman name for Hades, the king of the underworld in Greek mythology. Uh, Demeter is also known as Cirrus, depending on, on what you read. Uh, but So we've got a Greek name and a Roman name together. But notice, so Apollodorus is willing to divert from his original story to talk about these other tales. Then we've got the story of the revolt of the giants, the revolt of Typhon. So we're getting very much history. And notice the language here is not particularly exciting. This is very fact-driven, fact-based. Apollodorus simply wants to tell us what has happened in these stories. Uh, we've got the story of Prometheus here, okay. Uh, Zeus learned, so this is on page 36, we've got Prometheus providing fire, and we've got Zeus getting angry at him. You see several times in here Zeus getting enraged at various characters, and this is a very different depiction of Zeus that we're going to get from... Uh, Hesiod. And one thing we're going to want to track throughout the semester is how various writers are depicting our gods. If you have not studied myth, you probably have a very atypical perspective on what gods are. You know, you've probably been taught or have this notion that the gods are these very serene, peaceful beings who are very beyond humanity. Uh, but what we're going to see is that very often these gods act very human-like in terms of being jealous, emotional, petulant. Uh, they have attitude problems. They're very jealous. They're full of themselves. Uh, and we're going to see, we see that here. Okay, there's not really a ton that I want to say more about the Apollodorus text. Again, you don't need to, the only names that you really need to know for a quiz, for a test, would be the major characters. You know, what do we know about Zeus from this text? We know that he gets angry a lot. We know that he has taken down Kronos, his father. You should know Uranus and Gi. You should know that they are the parents of the Titans and Kronos and Rhea. And then that Zeus is their son. So we want to know the order of those major gods. But, you know, I'm not going to go into a quiz and ask you who the son who is the father of dodo that's somewhere on page 29 you know part of this whole long list you don't need to know all those names what you do need to know is to be able to talk about the fact that these characters are described and how they're described in in terms of what i mean by that is you should know that apollodorus is giving us this long list of names because he's creating a history you should be able to explain the distinction between style in Apollodorus and Hesiod. So Apollodorus so far, which is, we'll look at Hesiod here in a minute. Uh, Apollodorus is the one who is giving us a very cut and dry history. But he's interspersing that history with stories. So he's trying to expand this world, give us this expansive worldview of ancient Greece and all of these mythological creatures and characters. So what you should be able to do is take a look at a passage from Apollodorus and know that it comes from him. Because it's going to have a lot of names. It's not going to be particularly flowery in its language. And that's what you need to know about Apollodorus. Okay? Alright, so now we're going to take a look at Hesiod. I've had an interesting time whenever I teach these texts because I get very different perceptions of what these stories are like. Sometimes people like Apollodorus more, sometimes people like Hesiod. You can like whichever one you like. I often find that people have a bit of a harder time reading Hesiod's Theogony. Uh, and I think the reason for that, well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, this is a, a translation that is attempting to capture sort of the rhythm of the original. And the other reason is that this is attempting to be an artistic piece of work. He see it as very much more philosophical. He's flowery with his language. 
Uh, and he's also not exactly interested in creating a history. He's really writing a story about Zeus. He is praising Zeus. So I just want to look at some things that are evidence of this. Uh, and what I will try to do here, since depending on what you're looking at, if you're looking at it on the course site or in a Word document, it's, you know things are going to get formatted differently. I'll try to, when we jump to a particular paragraph, give you the line numbers. So you'll notice at the start of each paragraph, you've got uh, LL and then some numbers. Those are the line numbers. So again, we're, our, our translator, Hugh Evelyn White, is trying to let us know what lines we're looking at, even though he's writing in, in prose. Um, okay. So first things first, at the very beginning of this text, we've got, from the Heliconian muses, let us begin to sing. This is what we call an invocation. This is something that a poet of Hesiod's time would have done to invoke the muses, to ask them to inspire him to tell his story. So he wants assistance. There's a couple of reasons for this. This is simply a poetic convention. But also, by invoking the gods to tell his story, Hesiod can sort of displace blame if he says or writes something that might be considered unsavory or salacious. Uh, because he's saying it's coming directly from the gods. So it's not my fault if you don't like what I've written or what I'm saying here. Okay, but about midway through, we get, we start getting our first list of names. Well, we're not quite there, sorry. Uh, but if you look, we've got Zeus the Aegis Holder. And that phrase gets said a couple times. Zeus the Aegis Holder, once after another. So you might be wondering, well, why not just call him Zeus? Why do we do that? Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. One, again, Hesiod's project is not just to write the birth of the gods. Again, remember, that's what theogony means, birth of the gods. Uh, but also to craft, well, a couple of reasons. One, sorry, he is not just trying to write a birth of the gods, but he is focusing specifically on Zeus, our king god. He is sort of lifting up Zeus. This, this whole poem is praising Zeus. And so we're going to see that Zeus really can't do anything wrong here. Um, so that's one reason. You know, the Aegis Holder gives this very sort of particular sense of who Zeus is. Uh, but the other reason for this is when writing Greek poetry, Greek poets would have been under very particular rhyme scheme requirements. So you sort of have to write things a particular way. Uh, and, and they would use these things called epithets. That's what this is. The Aegis Holder after Zeus is called an epithet. E-P-I-T-H-E-T. -E -E and we're going to really see these a lot with Homer. But what these do is they have a particular syllabic sequence, a, a particular rhyme scheme, and they would fill up lines. And so that's why we're going to see at various places different epithets, in particular here for Zeus. So for example, if we, if we jump down to the lines 36 to 52, we see two of them. We've got Zeus the loud thunderer, Zeus the father of gods and men, and then we get again Zeus the Aegis holder. So again, this is, this is Hesiod trying to flex his artistic muscles, you know, not only to, uh, not only to show off his ability to be a good poet, but also to continue to praise Zeus, but also to fill those line requirements. Those different epithets each would have had a different syllabication that would have been used to fill in the lines that they needed to follow. Okay, we're going to leap down a little bit to 75 to 103. Again, we're not going to go through every single one of these paragraphs. I know this is a lot of reading, um, and hopefully you've read it all, and you should read it all. Uh, but we're just going to go through some highlights here. So in 75 to 103, actually towards the end there, we get this bit about the muses. And we get Hesiod saying, For it is through the muses and far-shooting Apollo that there are singers and harpers upon the earth. But princes are of Zeus, and happy is he whom the muses love. Sweet flows speech from his mouth. Now this is an interesting passage. We're getting a couple things here. One, we're seeing how the royalty comes from the gods. So the gods are the source of royalty. So this is why princes and kings 
should be revered because they come from the gods, but so do the muses. The muses provide singers with their strength, so artists are just as important, and obviously Hesiod would want to get this in there because he is an artist and wants to be important. Okay, let's take a little bit of a look at lines 116 to 138. Here we're going to see something that our friend Hesiod is going to do throughout here. We've got Verily, at the first, Chaos came to be. Chaos being the other name for Uranus. We're talking about the same character as Apollodorus, but with a different name. But next, wide-bosomed Earth. This would also be Gi or Gaia, which is spelled G-A-E-A. -E -A. Uh, the ever-sure foundations of all the deathless ones who hold the peaks and snows, blah, 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 blah. From Chaos came forth Erebus and Black Night. But of night were born Ether and Day, whom she conceived and bare from union in love with Erebus. Now, one thing that's interesting here is that Hesiod throughout this text is going to subsume the female. The male is going to have a much stronger role than the female will. This could be because Hesiod's a misogynist. It could also be just a reflection of Greek society, that men were considered significantly more important than women. At the end of this paragraph, we once again also see the hatred between father and son. Uh, you know, it says here that Cronus hated his lusty sire, he hates his father. Uh, and so we're again seeing these clashes between these various these various uh, generations. Okay, we're going to make another big jump down to lines 211 to 225, just to very quickly point out this interesting uh, dichotomy we get here between light and dark. Darkness throughout is considered negative. You know, we've got night bearing doom, black fate, death, sleep, and dreams blame and woe so night darkness is not a good thing in the greek world and we see this and we'll see this in in lots of different myths okay let's once again jump to lines 240 to 264. this is one of those passages again where you don't need to know any of these names really so, but this is where I just want to point something out. So we're getting another list of names. This is very similar to what we saw in Apollodorus. You should be, you know, familiar with this by now. You're probably going, oh God, another one of these lists of names. How do I blast through this? And you really can. The one thing I do want to point out is that every now and then we do get a description. We get rosy-armed Eunice, comely Galatea, lovely Hippotho, rosy-armed Hippono. Some of these names don't get that. The reason for this is, again, these are those epithets, those descriptions. The reason for this would have been, this would have been in poetic lines, and every now and then, Hesiod would have needed something to fill in a space that needed to be filled in to get that line to work correctly. This is why we don't see these in Apollodorus, because he's not worried about being poetic or following any sort of rhyming traditions. Um, then that's one of the, uh, again, one of the distinctions between these two texts. A couple of paragraphs down in lines 270 to 294, the only thing I want to point out here is this is going to give us a little bit of insight into some other stories. So we get a little bit about Pegasus fighting Medusa, cutting off her head. Uh, but notice that this is very briefly mentioned and it comes back to Zeus in some capacity. So we are embedding the basis for several other myths in Hesiod, but we're not actually reading them. Okay, so let's uh, move down a little further. You know, I'll just point out in lines 306 to 332, we see Typhon and Heracles again. Um, we don't get much of a story about them, though. So... Let's see, where do we want to take a look at? Okay, let's move down to lines 383 to 403. And here, all I want to point out here is, look, we're seeing victory, strength, being 
tied to Zeus again. These are children that Zeus had, and he says, even these have no house apart from Zeus, nor any dwelling nor path except that wherein God leads them. But they dwell always with Zeus the loud thunderer. So Zeus is again exalted. He even gets his own line at the end of that paragraph, but he himself mightily reigns and rules. Something I would like to point out is lines 453 to 491. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. First we get the line, but Rhea was subject in love to Kronos and bare splendid children. This is a very small line, but it's very telling. Rhea was subject in love to Kronos. She is again put secondary to Kronos. And then there's all these other gods, Demeter, Hera, Hades, Earthshaker. These are all gods that were birthed in the same generation as Zeus, but Zeus is still considered the father of these gods. What's also interesting here is the way the story of how Zeus and his ilk overcome Kronos is very interesting. You know, Kronos swallows all of his children. Uh, Rhea, in the other texts that we've looked at, is the one who comes up with the plan to save Zeus. Here, however, it's not. She has help. So we're seeing again, uh, clearly Hesiod doesn't think that a woman could be the one to do this. Uh, in the Rosenberg text, passage that you hopefully read last week, Gaia is the one who comes up with this plan. But here, there has to be other help, because to, to Hesiod, women cannot do this on their own. We see this further, we're going to zoom down again to 561. who speaks in anger, this is about the only time he does anything angry, uh, but he is considered wise, whose wisdom is everlasting. So even despite being tricked, uh, Zeus here is considered wise. And he also never throws Hephaestus down. So remember in the Apollodorus text, he is responsible for Hephaestus being, uh, being handicapped, I suppose. Whereas here, he does not ever get blamed for that. Even just another, this is where we really see Hesiod's misogyny coming out, is in lines 590 to 612, essentially saying that women are evil. From her is the race of women and female kind, the woman of beautiful evil. Zeus, who thunders on high, made women to be an evil to mortal men, with a nature to do evil. But then he goes on to say that they're necessary, which is a bit strange. Uh, but so we're seeing this really distaste for women in, uh, in Hesiod's text. Okay, let's see. Most of the remainder of what we've got here is very much uh, more of that historical stuff. Uh, the one thing I would mention is as you get closer to the end, so we're going to skip way down, down here to uh, all the way to line 930. Notice that these sections are very, very short. And part of the reason for that is these are not related to Zeus. And so passages that get the most attention from Hesiod are those that are about his pal Zeus. Okay, so uh, again, I recognize that this does not address everything in here, but I think we've hit on some of the most important things. Again, what you really need to be knowledgeable about with Hesiod is his interest in Zeus. How does this text differ from Apollodorus? Be cognizant of the major players. So again, characters like Kronos, Hera, his wife, uh, Rhea, Gaia, 
and just the things that have popped up in both of these texts that you think you should be familiar with. Again, I'm not going to ask you in any way to be able to recount any of the lengthy passages with lots and lots of names. That's not the goal here. The goal here is simply for you to understand how these different writers are doing similar things. Remember, they're both interested in lineage. So even though Hesiod is focused on Zeus, he still places some emphasis on lineage. Uh, but he is much more artistic about it, whereas Apollodorus is writing a history. And so that's what you really want to be mindful of. Okay, that should do it for this audio lecture. There will be several more of these throughout the semester. Um, and again, it would be ideal for you to have your materials in front of you. I think the next one is in a couple of weeks when we look at Oedipus Rex. Let me check on that real fast before I promise that's the case. Yes, so that should be it. So, uh, in theory, all you should have left to do this week is the quiz and perhaps the discussion board. So, I will bid you adieu with that, and thank you for listening to this lecture on Hesiod and Apollodorus.